This happened to me when I was about 17. My name is Kurt, and on this night, myself and my two friends Mike and Darren were out driving aimlessly, looking to be scared by anything. Our original plans were to down a few brews and play Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 while Mike's parents were away at a party or something. I forget. But when our beer hookup flaked on us, this is what we came up with. Now, where Mike lives, there wasn't much to do. He lives in Bumblefuck, Pennsylvania. It's a nice area, quiet and safe, but just nothing around for miles except woods and abandoned barns. We've done this before, because at night, all of those woods and barns can look really creepy. Our hope tonight was to maybe explore one of those barns, for shits and giggles, and hopefully some scares. But after driving for an hour or so, and none of us wanting to dirty our sneakers, stupid teenagers, I know, we decided to just drive. Add another half hour or so of aimless driving, and I get bored and say I want to go back to Mike's and start playing some Call of Duty and eat some pizza. Darren wants to drive a little longer and find anything to make this all worthwhile. We decided to drive for another 15 minutes, and if nothing cool gets spotted or whatever, we're going to head back. I'll admit, I had no clue where we were, and hadn't for probably an hour or so. All I could say was, not too long before things went to shit, my ears popped, so I assumed we must have gone up some kind of mountain. I tell Darren that time is up, and Mike looks at Darren and says, Sorry dude, we tried. Mike says he's going to find a driveway to turn around in, and we'll head back. Wherever we were at this point was densely wooded with forest and had no streetlights, so our only source of light was Mike's headlights which he had to throw on to high beams because of how dark it was. We kind of see a house in the distance, and hope it has a driveway to turn around in. The closer we get, we see that there is a car parked in front of the house. As a matter of fact, it was a cop car, a statey to be precise, as state troopers patrolled this area since it had no local police force. We pulled up to it, and realized that it is actually blocking the other side of the road, with its headlights on, facing the house we saw. Darren gets a smile on his face and says this could be some kind of drug bust and that it would be cool to see. I myself was getting a bit of a red flag syndrome from this. First off, the cop car was blocking the road rather than parked off to the side or in the driveway. Secondly, why did he have his headlights on, illuminating the house? And worst of all, why was the driver's side door just left open with no one else around? I tell Mike and Darren, I think we should keep going and find another way to get back home. Mike says he doesn't know the area too well up here, so he would rather turn around and head back the way we came. I suggested finding another place to turn around in, then, but Darren begs us to stay just for five minutes to see if we can at least see an arrest, saying it would be a cool story to tell back at school on Monday. I look at Mike, who doesn't look too convinced, but he says he's cool with it if I am. Knowing I wouldn't hear the end of how much of a pussy I was from Darren if I said no, I just agreed but only for five minutes, then we turn around and head home. No bullshit. Darren nearly jumps out of his seat in excitement, and Mike backs up a good distance down the road, and we pull over to watch. It was a nice autumn night, a little warm even, so we had our windows down, enjoying a cool breeze. I grew more and more uncomfortable the longer we were there, praying for this five minutes to end. I keep thinking to myself how wrong this whole situation was. It was quiet, like too quiet. No animals, no anything. Even the breeze seemed to make no sound. I looked at my phone and saw the five minutes was up. I made the announcement and we were all satisfied enough to leave, even Darren. Mike puts the keys back in the ignition and before he could even start the car, we see something moving in the headlights of the cruiser. A man, or so I concluded in the moment, was walking from the back of the house around to the front. He was dressed in all black and Every step he took illuminated something metallic in his hand in the headlights of the cruiser. Now, Mike and Darren join me in a red flag state of mind. Darren tells Mike to get the fuck out of there. Mike tells him he doesn't want whoever it is to hear us or see us. It made sense. It was so damn dark out, all we could see was what the cruiser illuminated. So we should have been hidden in the darkness where we were from the house. The three of us just sat there, waiting for this guy, whomever he was to go away for a minute so we could kick rocks out of there. The guy walks up to the cruiser and looks around as if to see if anyone was around. I prayed he didn't see us, but before I could finish, he just looks our way and stares, not moving. My stomach sinks. Mike, is he fucking looking at us? I asked in a panic. 
No, dude, no way. It's too dark. He can't possibly see us. Mike, equally as panic, answered. Then the guy smiles. Don't ask how I knew for sure. I just did. He smiles and begins to take menacing steps towards our car. He fucking sees us, dude. Fucking drive, Darren yelled out. Mike hits the ignition and his car roars to life. He hits the high beams, blinding the guy momentarily, and guns it in reverse, doing the most reckless U-turn ever, almost taking us off the road and into the woods. We gun it back to Mike's house, doing 100 miles an hour the entire way. I shit you not. None of us had the balls to look behind us to see if we were being followed. After what seemed like an eternity, we made it back to Mike's place. He must have been clicking the garage door opener for an entire block beforehand when we finally pulled into his garage. We close the door and run in the house. We make sure all the doors are locked and the lights are off. We stand in the living room, trying to figure out what the fuck just happened. Mike heads over to his front window that has the view of the main road to his house. I don't think anyone followed us, he says. Darren begins to laugh, and I couldn't help it, so did I. Mike joins us in laughter, and all of our hearts racing with adrenaline. I compose myself enough to tell the guys I'm going to start the oven and make the pizzas. Mike says that sounds good. He and Darren will head to the basement and start up the PS3. I throw the pizzas in the oven after it preheats and head down to the basement where the usual trolling has already begun. How quickly we put what just happened behind us. I get one game in and almost rage quit from noob tubers when my phone dings telling me the pizzas are done. I head upstairs to grab them and take them back down to eat. I take the pizzas out of the oven and slice them. I open the fridge to get some grated cheese before heading back down. Now so all you know, Mike's kitchen was small and it had a sliding glass door that led to the backyard. The fridge was directly across from this door. As I turn back around to grab the pizzas, I see what looks like a man crouched walking towards the back entrance to the garage. I almost piss myself as I run back down into the basement. Mike looks at me and laughs, asking me if I needed help bringing down the food. I tell him and Darren what I just saw, and the whole mood changes in an instant. I tell him and Darren what I just saw, and the whole mood changes in an instant. It's that fucking guy. He followed us, Darren says. Before anyone can respond, we hear the doorbell ring. If my heart was attached to anything at this point, it wasn't anymore. All the air left my body, and we all just stood there, unsure of what to do. The doorbell rang again, followed by an almost taunting knock at the door. We quietly head upstairs. Mike grabbed his baseball bat and led the way. We all get down low and walk to the front door. Mike looks through the peephole in the door and sinks to the floor with a blank expression on his face. It was the same guy from earlier. It didn't need to be said out loud. I know you guys are there. I'm a police officer. I'm here to ask you guys about what you saw earlier, so let me in, the guy says. Bullshit. We have the real cops coming here any minute, so get the fuck out of here. I yell as manly and scary as I could muster. The guy laughs and says in a matter of fact kind of way, Well I guess I should hurry up then and make sure you guys can't tell anyone anything. See you boys shortly. We hear him walk away, and we all look at each other terrified. Mike's mother has an old piano in the living room, mainly for show. Darren begins trying to push it in front of the door. I notice and walk over and start helping him. I yell for Mike to give us a hand. When I look for him, he's gone. I ask Darren where Mike went and he says he has no clue, but to keep pushing. We manage to move the piano in front of the door when we hear the glass sliding doors smashing in the kitchen. Darren and I look into the kitchen and see the man standing in the house, smiling, with the most crazed look in his eyes. In his hand is a large butcher's knife with blood smeared on it. Gotcha, he says arrogantly. Darren and I just stand there, not sure of what to do or where to go, as we just sealed off our only way outside. Don't run, boys. It won't help you. Nothing can help you now, the man says, smiling. I'm not afraid to admit I started crying at this point. My only thought was, this is it. I'll never see the morning again. I'll never see my family again. Time did not slow, nor did my life flash before my eyes when the man started running towards us. All I remember next is a loud, ear-shattering pop sound, quickly followed by two more, and the smell of something hot. Once the ringing in my ears settled down a bit, I opened my eyes and looked towards where the guy was at. He was now lying on the floor motionless. I look around and see Darren 
next to me, equally as confused as me. Then we see from the staircase Mike standing there, aiming his father's revolver. I run over to Mike, who is visibly trembling, and grab the gun from him. He just looked at me, with tears in his eyes, and sat down on the stairs. Darren wound up calling the cops. We had to move the piano out of the way so that they could come in. They took Mike's dad's gun and called all of our parents. They finished questioning us by the time the parents started arriving. They said Mike did the right thing and that he saved all of our lives. I could tell that none of that meant much to Mike, who had to deal with taking another person's life. I'm sure, no matter what the circumstances are, that must weigh heavy on someone. The officers cleared us to leave as the coroner arrived. Mike and his parents wound up having to stay at a hotel over the next couple of days while things got cleaned up. They only stayed at that house for a few more months before moving to a new house, closer to us actually. I know for a fact that if it weren't for Mike's quick thinking and his father's gun, I would not be here today to tell you this story. I may not be the biggest fan of guns, but that was one moment I was damn sure glad we had one. Mike eventually got over the whole thing, but did not like talking about it. He is actually in the middle of the police academy as we speak, in hopes of becoming an officer of the law himself. As for what we stumbled upon that led to all of this, from what I read, Officer Keenan, that was the name I found, responded to a domestic call. He found a deceased woman in her thirties upon entering the house. Before he could call for backup, he was ambushed by a male from behind and murdered in the line of duty. We must have came not too long after the fact, when our stalker came out of the house and saw us. The three of us are still thick as thieves and always will be, though this is an incident we would like to just forget. It has forever bonded us as friends, and I'm just glad we all survived this.